that the, just the way the tone shifted so, so vastly, um, what it reminded me of, um, and I think you'll really appreciate this, especially like in comic books, when you, when you go from, from when you change creative teams, um, frequently you, you can, you know, you can really tell like mm-hmm. the difference in, in tone on the book. Um, and what this movie sort of like in my head, if this movie is a comic book, it's um, it's written by um, oh sorry who's who's the guy on Squirrel Girl? Ryan North. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is Thor written by Ryan North. If it's a comic book, yeah, and I would agree and like and, and and with the same art team too. Like this this if they adapted this movie into a comic book, it should be done by the squirrel girl team because like that is the tone of this movie. So here's an interesting thing I learned from this little book that came with a collector's edition. They intentionally tried to make the, uh, the feel of the design of the movie more Jack Kirby ish. That does not surprise me even in the slightest because what I wrote down in my notes is this is the most comic book Marvel movie yet. Yeah, it's, so the production designer, Dan Henna, says Jack Kirby was the key artist for Marvel from the very early days. Yep. We started examining the Jack Kirby work in thinking it's true to the genre. It's the origin of the genre, really. And it would be a great opportunity to showcase as we use that influence. So, yeah, they definitely went, you know, Jack Kirby-ish here, which I don't think is a bad thing. No, um, no, it's not. Because, again, like, there's a reason why these stories and this medium has had the, 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 the lasting cultural impact that it has. And a lot of that I think is due to how effectively it was produced, you know, at the beginning. And it really captured the imaginations of, of people who have, you know, sort of carried that torch on and, and pushed these these narratives forward. And I got to say one thing that might color my love for this movie is I've always loved the sort of like early eighties <laughs> metal type, you know, like, like the way things look like, even like the font and color of Ragnarok, you know, that you see, it's like, it's got that sort of like early eighties tone to it. And, and the, and the sort of music that they use yeah. were sort of like this kind of eighties electronica, just as synthesizers were being invented yep. kind of thing. Um, I loved it. I thought that I just maybe it didn't fit with the previous franchise, but I loved what they did. Like and pretty much all the changes to this, I loved it. <laughs> that's another note that I made very specifically is like, wow, this movie is so eighties. Yes, and that's why I love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, another thing, and- this is this was right underneath the note that I made that just says "silly Wonka." Yes. <laughs> so. You noticed, oh, yeah. I think that's what you're referring to, you noticed that like at when he's on um, Sakaar and going to meet the Grand Master, they've got the, they've got the Willy Wonka Pure Imagination theme song, yeah. Playing in the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and speaking so, of the Grand just, Master, Jeff Goldblum is just being Jeff Goldblum in this movie. Oh, like, and he's, he's not fantastic. even act, he's not even playing a character. He's just like oh, being I love him Jeff so much. Goldblum. Um, I love him so much. Of, I and I I do have a, a lot of appreciation for Jeff Goldblum. Do you know? Have you ever heard of the uh, stand-up comedian named uh, Frank Caliendo? Yeah, in fact, I just heard him. So, <laughs> so he um, has a bit about Jeff Goldblum. Where he's saying, he says, like, Jeff Goldblum is a guy who will commit 110% and then turn on a dime. You'll ask him, (laughs) Jeff, what's your favorite food? Oh, my favorite food. Hmm, My favorite food. Very interesting. Yes. um, I like hot dogs. Uh, Chili dogs are better. Wait a minute. I'm a vegetarian. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. I did just hear him. He's. Um, so I have an hour commute to my current job, and oh, to wow. my shame, I listened to Bob and Tom in the morning and started, <laughs> book, started actually enjoying it. And they had Frank Caliendo on like all week last week. Like oh, he wow. was one of their speakers. Maybe not all week, but a lot of the week. And yeah, he does really good impressions. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Okay, so to tie the whole like theme 
the whole like changes in theme back to Norse mythology and music, the immigrant song is perfect yeah. for yeah. this movie and for the whole like there's a lot of Norse mythology theme because it's I mean it's about Norse culture. It is. Um, um, so one thing that I had like a mistaken impression of that I kind of think almost would have been better is at the end when they're when they're doing the big fight on the on the rainbow bridge and Thor is using all of his lightning powers. I think that sh- song should have been should have been thunderstruck instead. Uh, maybe. But yeah, it could have been. That would, but it that would have been fun. Been, even been too on the nose. Maybe. maybe it would have been. I like that they tied it back into like the beginning of the movie. Like the opening fight scene is sort of tied into the end fight scene by the um, Led Zeppelin. Sure. You know, and that and it makes total sense. It's it's a very very valid choice. Like for me, like my impression of it, even like later when I thought back on it, I was thinking, oh, did they play? Was it Thunderstruck? Or was it the other song? I couldn't even remember because for me that would have fit yeah. in there so yeah. well. Here's one thing, since they did make some abrupt changes to the franchise, one thing that I like that was well executed, I think, was like at the very beginning, the director communicated to you that this is going to be a very different Thor movie. Mm-hmm. So if you don't like it, you better leave the theater now. Yeah. <laughs> because like the very first line, Thor is breaking the fourth wall yeah. and talking to the audience, you right. know? <laughs> which I loved. I thought that was great. It was fun. Um, and it's like, well, actually what's funny is it seems like he's talking to the audience, but then you realize like, (laughs) I feel like he broke the fourth wall and didn't at the same time, Yes, you know, like, like it seems like he's talking to the audience, but then he's talking to that skeleton that's in the cage with him. Yeah. Um, so one, uh, like a whole big chunk of this movie is like a semi adaptation of the uh, co- the story arc from the comics uh, called Planet Thor or Planet Hulk. Okay, and it, Planet Hulk is a great story. Um, it sounds stupid, but it's probably good. <laughs> it is. It's fantastic. It is a great, great Hulk story. So at at the point, and it's it's also from not too many years ago. It's a recent. It's a recent story, so if you go like back... Like some of the and, best things in life, it sounds stupid, but it's actually fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you go back and look it up, like it's not going to be you know jarringly dated in terms of, of any of its references or its artistic style. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, it's was, it was from... It's probably from about eight to ten years ago. And at that point one of the things that you had going on in the Marvel uh, in Marvel comics was like some of the most powerful heroes had sort of formed this secret society. Um, and they were sort of like shepherding like all of the events on earth and like trying to, to influence things and, and make sure that things went well. Like it was all from, <laughs> from good intentions. And so it was Dr. Strange and professor <laughs> X and Namor and Mr. Fantastic and somebody else that I can't remember right now. Um, Black Panther refused to join. He said, this is going to go badly if you guys mm-hmm. try to to control things in the way that it looks like you want to. I'm not going to have any part of it. Um, but uh, one of the decisions that they eventually made was that Hulk has got to go. And essentially they, they tricked him into getting into a, into a space shuttle ostensibly to fix some satellite that was going to crash into earth or whatever. And, you know, we're going to send him off to this like idyllic planet where everything was going to be fine and he could live out his life in peace. Like all he's ever wanted. Mm -hmm. Well, because it's comics and we can't have nice things. Um, the, the ship fell through a wormhole and ended up on this like barbaric planet of, of gladiatorial nonsense called Sakaar. And eventually, you know, Hulk, you know, rose up in the ranks of the, of the, of the arena. And, uh, in the end, like came to like rule the whole planet. 
Okay, cool. And uh, that, that sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah. And then um and then the uh the warp drive on the ship like malfunctioned and basically broke the planet in half and like killed everybody. Oh, well that's a little bit and, sad. And that's so, a little bit of an honor after that. <laughs> <laughs> and so then so then he like, you know, came back to Earth to exact his revenge on the heroes that sent him away. And that was, oh, dang. that was all in the story called World War Hulk, where basically everybody <laughs> is, everybody's fighting the Hulk because he's got a mat on and also sound hilarious and terribly awesome. <laughs> it, it, it also was a pretty good story. So the way that that was adapted in this film, honestly, like didn't really work for me. Um, like, the stuff that's on Sakaar, like in the context of the film itself, it's fine and it and it okay. works and it's great. I'm sad that we don't actually get like a, a real honest to goodness, full on Planet Hulk adaptation. And the reason that we don't is because of the way that Hulk's movie rights are still a little bit complicated because Marvel doesn't 100 percent own the movie rights to the Hulk. They have him, they can use him in any story, but a standalone Hulk film at this point, um, Universal Studios still has the distribution rights for Uh, those films. And so because of that, we're basically never going to have a standalone Hulk movie at this point. Again. Yeah. Which is fine with me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty to do without telling standalone uh, Hulk stories. What makes me a little bit sad about that is that there's there's kind of a lot of cool stuff in in the Hulk's lore, and he has a really interesting rogues gallery, um, more so than I think actually a lot of other Marvel heroes, um, because. One of the most and and one for me one of his most interesting villains that actually was foreshadowed in the the movie with um uh who is who who played Edward Norton, Edward Norton um is a, is a villain called the Leader who is um also like a gamma powered uh, villain but rather than gaining great strength he gained great intelligence and mental powers. And okay. so this clash of like muscle versus versus yeah. brains is is kind of an interesting uh, sort of thematic uh, yeah. note that you get with with those conflicts. But anyway, I guess, I guess the only reason I said I'm OK with that <laughs> in my ignorance of the comics is that, you know, the Hulk movie, in my opinion, was like the the worst of the MCU so far, you know, yeah. Um yeah, I mean, pr- pr- I guess so. But, and I don't know. But, like, but it's like still not a character. bad movie. No, it's not. It's a good movie. Um, but, and also, I just feel like as a character, like, I, I've never really liked him. And that might just be a me thing. Like, I, I, I guess I don't, I don't dislike him, but um, it's just been like there's far more interesting characters to me. I was always like, oh, he's just a guy that turns green and smashes things, you know, like. <laughs> And there is some interesting interplay with, like, you know, Banner and the Hulk actually being two different people and, like, sort of fighting each other inside, which right. this movie, Ragnarok, really brings that out a yeah. lot, which I thought was a good, <clears throat> you know, thing here. Um, so I want to go back to Sakaar for a little bit. Yeah. Because I just thought, and I didn't realize that this was a, a concept in the comics, but... I thought just the idea of, like, a sort of dump of the universe where all of, like, the errant sort of... Yeah, uh, things that are lost and unloved. Yeah, or, or like, yeah, like, what do they call it in the movie? Like, lost gateways. Like, basically, like, they're, like, where, like, you take a wrong turn or fall out of a wormhole and you end up there. Yeah. I just thought that was, like, such a cool concept. Yeah, you know? it's int- and I kind of, honestly, I sort of wish that they had fleshed that out a little bit more and given, like, a better reason for Sakaar to be, like, this nexus of, of like, wrong turns. Um, because, you know, given given the kind of, given the kind of, like, distance 